Sorry, I'm late. I had to uh, take care of some business and I did not get a connection inside this room. So I had to go all the way outside and I got lost. Anyway, that was pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> uh, does anyone have any back and forths I can use? I did not bring any paper. Yeah, great, great. Awesome. Great. So, um, you know, I always, I always kind of uh, toy with the idea of having kind of a set presentation. And, uh, but I kind of prize my spontaneity and creativity. And it'd be easier just to kind of do the same thing at each and every panel. But I kind of like to do things based on inspiration and kind of feedback of the crowd. So, uh, how many of you guys went to the panel I did last year? Uh, all right. How many of you guys are, are new to Comic Con in general? Lot. All right, how many of you are aspiring artists? Okay, how many of you here for free sketches? Right. <laughs> how many of you are going to eBay those sketches? Oh, come on. There's got to be at least one honest person here, right? Las Vegas? Honest people. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about, I don't know, some topic of my choosing. Um, a different panels I've talked about how to draw um, hands, how to draw action figure, dynamic figures. Uh, if you go online and you know search YouTube, you'll find some of that stuff. And so in, in a weird way, over the past couple of years, I've been kind of doing an online course through all these different panels and different things to draw. Um, I thought today maybe I would maybe work on how to draw the female figure. And uh, really kind of Walk through that, and I'll, I'll probably do a couple sketches of like Harley Quinn and uh, maybe Supergirl, whatever. So, uh, also, while I'm drawing, I'm kind of drawing talks, so maybe I'll start taking some questions from the audience. But um, I thought, first of all, uh, if, if, if any of you guys don't know who I am, I'm Jim Lee. I co publisher, sorry, of DC Comics, and I also draw Superman on Chain. Uh, for some reason, there was something online where um, it said the book was canceled, but really the, solicita the solicitations were canceled. The book uh, is still coming out. There's three issues left. The next issue comes out, I believe, next Wednesday, right? I think. And then uh, the eighth issue comes out in uh, July, August, and then the last issue comes out in September. The last issue is double sized, so I'm working on issue eight right now. And um, uh, yeah, so you can't always believe what you read online. So, um, anyway, so I am going to start by, uh, I've been drawing comics now for about 27 years, and, uh, you know, it's interesting, back in the day when I started, there was no internet, there was uh, very few comic book conventions, so I really, I just learned how to draw by going to the library and checking out some books, and there weren't a lot of drawing books, but the one that really helped me out was by a guy named uh, George, um, I don't know if he had it either, but Bridgman. So there's a bunch of books of, uh, of his, and uh, it really talks about looking at the totality of the figure, and not so much the uh, the muscles per se. So I, I kind of know the muscle groups, but I don't really overly focus on what's a pec and what's a deltoid or what's a uh, a bicep. I mean, I, I know where they are, but that's less important to me than the overall shape of something, right? So let me uh, take out some tools here. So, when talking about the uh, female form, generally people think of the uh, hourglass shape, which is something like right, something like that, right. So, try try to think of the upper torso as a shape like this. I don't know how to quite describe this. Maybe an ant head, right? If this were an ant. Right? You see that? Okay. So if you draw an ant, you can draw a female figure. Right? So just draw the head, get rid of the mouth, the antennae, antennae, right? So that slot is where the uh, shoulder comes in. Here, anyway, think of an action figure, or think of a uh, Barbie or whatever. If you take them apart, they're articulated, they tend to have this kind of area, this is the chest, and this is the center line. And there's a hole up here for the neck, and the other arm slot goes back over here. This is the, uh, the edge of the rib cage, 
the diaphragm or whatever is down here. And then you have the pelvis, which is uh, kind of like a shape like this. Like think of a heart, right? And then put a little hole on the side. And that would be the pelvis. And so if you have those two and you put them like that, or you can move this pelvis around if, if the figure's in motion. But you start out with just the, the torso and the pelvis, and that creates the, uh, the dynamic in the figure, and then you can just kind of connect them up, draw some uh, limbs, all right? All right, and there, there you have the figure, all right? So, to make it more dynamic, See if, uh, okay, there's that, the ant head here. And, you know, to keep it simple, I would just kind of draw that same three-quarter perspective. And maybe we'll put the pelvis down here. And obviously when I draw, I don't, I tend not to do this, I mean, I, I kind of keep it more simple, but in your mind, you should always be thinking about this. Okay. I don't know what, what this character's doing. Um, <laughs> I think it's good. Um, okay. So, what you just saw was probably what you shouldn't do. I try to tend to think of an overall gesture. Okay. In my mind, I kind of, my, my mind's eye, I have this idea of what this character's doing. And then, after I kind of have that gesture, I think of that torso shape, think of that pelvis shape. And it's basically uh, Harlequin kind of leaning back in a chair, holding a, a big uh, hammer. See that? Maybe her arm is kind of right. So that, this is what's called a gesture drawing, as you see it has a lot of energy to it. That's something that you want to really capture because as you refine it, it becomes less and less dynamic, it becomes more and more static. And the, the way you can create a lot of energy in the figure is by creating this energy and then really figuring out the best line to kind of capture and, and, and keep that, uh, that energy going. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> What I'm doing. Um, <laughs> what the hissing? What's the hissing for? I don't. Uh, so okay. So do you have most of it down there? So now here's an important thing with these things. A lot of people draw heads on figures. And they, they keep it really static. And the trick to drawing more evocative poses is, is bring that head up or down. So you're you're raising the chin or lowering it down. It just creates a little more attitude. So if this is going to be Harley Quinn, and I'm going to draw the original costume just because it's easier to, for me to do from memory. Right, so if that's the headline, the head, mm -hmm. the silhouette of the head, that's the chin, that's the ligaments of the neck, right? And then, you have that, and then uh, you have this other thing jig here. Now, the, uh, there's that game, uh, the neck bone, or the <laughs> it's connected to the collarbone. There's no neck bone, but uh, this neck ligament goes here. And like I said, I'm not really great on the names, but I do know there's a divot here. We all have this kind of the collarbone here. And that's an important line because from the collarbone, it goes to the top of the, of the uh, shoulder. So you can even see with that hand, I just kind of get a very basic shape. I'm going to go in there and add the detail later. It's less critical, but I'm really looking at these outside lines. But in my mind, I'm also thinking about the, the shapes in, in, in between. That's really what George Bridgman taught, is that I don't know all the tricep muscles that go up in here, but I do want to retain that kind of round shape, right? And that arm kind of fits into that socket. And this is your pec muscle, right? So you can see I'm sort of still following. So falling down to 
Does that make sense? Now here's where that pelvis comes into play. This is the, uh, the high point of the pelvic bone here. And it comes down and then the, the leg comes out of that slot that we drew here. Space. But so here's here's the length of this leg. Here's that thigh. I'm gonna put it over here, and so you kind of know that this thigh is about this long. Does she have boots, or is it? There's something down here, right? Has anyone cos has anyone cla cosplayed as Harley Quinn here? Anyone? No, no. You're in a different costume. Though. Does she wear boots? What's she has something on her heels, right? Like Robin Hood. Right, okay. Right. Thank you. This should be accreditation for being co-publisher DC. Uh, guys, we should know this kind of stuff. Uh, that's so embarrassing. Anyway. So here's where that, that, uh, that hourglass shape comes in, right? It's, it pinches in at the hips, comes out. She's got a little bit of a boyish figure because she's a little slender. And then uh, I know that with this hand up, you're going to see the underside of this, this palm. So in perspective, I can almost creak it out like that. See that? That's, the, that's this part here. That's, that's the, the top part of the fingers here. And uh, the elbow comes out here. And it just kind of fits in there. Right? Maybe a little bit longer. And you can see I'm kind of adjusting it on the fly. Um, I haven't been drawing for about a week. <laughs> so I'm learning as I'm doing this. Uh, okay, here's the foot. And if you notice, I don't really worry too much about the, the feet. The thing about feet and hands is you can kind of just place them and then attach them to the rest of the body. So like for instance, if you're gonna do, draw something in perspective, like a hand coming out at you, sometimes I'll just draw the uh, the hand first, right? And just kind of, uh, I did it wrong. <laughs> draw, <laughs> let's say you draw the face, and then I'll just draw the hand, right? There's a the shoulder. And sometimes I'll just draw the hand first, because you know the hand has to connect up to the body. And so in a way, you save yourself the aggravation of trying to figure out how this works. Just put the head and the hand, and then just put the rest in between. That make sense? And if you end up with a hand um, too far away from the, the head, you're drawing Mr. Fantastic. Uh, so. right. Anyway. <laughs> That's how the character fight created, right? Jack Kirby. He's probably a regular guy in powers, just a scientist, and drew the hand too far away and said, oh, he stretches. Anyway. Okay, so I, I, drew, I drew the foot, and if you notice, like the ankle would be here, that foot would be really short, so... But I like the placement of the foot, so I know that the heel is down here, so I'm going to basically send that down here. Doesn't look so nice in, in, the, uh, in the ink. But let me think. This side is black, right? This side is black, so that side is... Black. Oh my god, this is so complicated. Um, no wonder we changed the costume. Um, black, black. Alright, I have no idea. Does anyone have, anyone have a connection that can Google this real quick for me? Alright, great. Do the hammer? <laughs> okay. You could be a great editor. Uh, I don't have the full script for it. Why don't you just draw the pages that we gave you and worry about the other stuff later? That's the, that's the new costume, but okay, but that helps. All right. Right, so this is black, 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 so this is black, this is red. Ah, that doesn't help. If it were black, it could just black it out. I'll use white out. Anyway, so she's got, she's sitting on this chair, but now I'm thinking in my head, I'm trying to save this uh, sketch real quick. There's uh, these things that uh, they put on the back of elephants. 
or ride on. Right? So I'm going to make it kind of this improvised uh, thing that has. Oh. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you for the contribution. Um, do you have a you have a passcode? Do you have any good pictures on this? <laughs> oh, I don't even know what she's doing. So she's holding the hammer in a very different way. Anyway, I'll have to figure that out later. All right, so we got this. Okay, so we got uh, got to have to have this. shadows, and you'll see why they're so useful. Okay, so I'm just basically kind of improvising kind of a sketch. He's looking a little concerned because this is not what he signed up for. <laughs> um, I screwed it up, so she's got to basically no, no, I'm just going to turn it this way. All right. So once you have kind of like the basic shapes like this, most of the drawing is really done, right? I mean, you really have... Once I get to this point, I feel pretty comfortable with it. I've got the shapes down. Her head looks a little bit big, but uh, it's Harley Quinn. The eyes go here, the nose goes there, the mouth goes here, right? We all know that, right? We all look at ourselves in the mirror, we know. You have reference every day, look at yourself. So there are the eyes. You should start with the eyes because uh, they show the expression and the emotion. So it's really critical that you nail that and get it in the right spot. She has kind of a, a pert little nose here like this. And then a kind of maniacal smile. Here. So if I were drawing this in pencil, I would be erasing as I went along, as I kind of basically draw the structure and erase some of that line. line work. See, sometimes I do these very kind of quick lines like that. That's basically to create a, uh, a gradient. And a gradient is when you go from black to white. So if you have it's kind of what cross hatching is. So if you have light cross hatching and then you can get denser, right? It's just creating because we don't have the ability to create gray tones using uh, ink. And so uh, we use cross hatching as a way. If you kind of squint at that, it's a kind of a light gray to a dark gray to a solid black. Right? So you can do that a number of ways. You can either crosshatch, right? Or you can do it like this. So that's what I'm doing. Just, it just creates a little more variation. So this is a light gray that goes to a dark black here. Okay. And uh, same thing where maybe I'm going from this dark black here to a lighter shade of gray. 
So you can see as I add element after element, it starts to feel a little more finished, a little more solid. And, and, and I like to kind of jump around because I don't want to get too invested in one area, finish it off, and then realize, you know what, I need to move that entire head over a quarter of an inch, uh, which happens sometimes. And so I want to just make sure as I'm kind of going along, I'm always checking things against each other. And um, she really should have a whip here, I think. <laughs> um, anyway. Okay. So that's the, uh, the brow of Batman, casts a shadow. This area casts a shadow across the nose. This plane right here is flat against your face. So if there's a light source behind it, it's dark. And then we can make the rest of this all black. The nose is going to cast a shadow across the upper lip. He's got that perpetual Batman skull. Right. His ear is right there. It casts a shadow against the side of his head. And he starts to see uh, his figure kind of coming together, right? up here. This is incorrect reference. Uh, uh, it's slightly incorrect. It's alright. Everyone kind of does it differently anyway. This is fine. I'm good. Oh, you're, you're pulling up my own reference to embarrass me. Alright, thank you. <laughs> Batman punch. I did this over 10 years ago, sir. And I remember all that. It doesn't look as good. Uh, <laughs> alright, so I've got enough there to kind of finish this off. Um, I know that this is black. The thing is, she's wearing a, a, a costume, it, it's skin tight, but it, you know, I want to suggest that it's cloth. And so, cloth will basically create wrinkles wherever it bends. So at the, uh, the joints, at the, uh, the shoulder joints, and also if you bend in the middle of the, of, of the figure, you're going to get some, some uh, lines here like that. And so you want to basically show that. And with this kind of material, it's like spandex or something, so it's kind of shiny black, and so it'll have a, a rim light, right, an edge light that basically makes it look like it's reflecting a light source next to it. It's actually really easy, you can just black out all the inner shapes there, the muscles, and then just keep the, uh, the rim light on the edges to suggest the, uh, the light bouncing off the black um, costume itself. So here, this other hand that I kind of greeted out before, again, don't get too concerned about where all the fingers go. Just know that there are knuckles across this, this ridge here. So you draw one, two, three, four knuckles. Yeah, that's enough. And maybe a little shadow of the, of the fingers underneath, but it's not super critical. Because again, most people do not go and look at that kind of detail. They're looking at the whole drawing, the, the, the gist of it. But, uh, okay, let's see. Okay. So I've got this, and to uh, make it go faster, I've got some ink and a brush. It's kind of a funky brush. It's not the one I brought. I didn't bring the brush. But um, let's see if I can get some stuff here. Start with the easy part, which is uh, Batman. I know that he's mostly going to be in shadow. So I'm just going to basically come in and just 
So you, you kind of feather that black into the gray shapes there. And again, it's like a drape that falls over a shoulder. If you were to take the cloth and drape it over your hand, it would fall like a... Uh, if you were to draw your uh, finger, <laughs> right? Okay. You put a cloth over it. The cloth will basically create and they all go back to that point if that makes any sense same way if you have a shirt and you come down to kind of where it bends right so you can kind of see Right, so the folds are going to be where the arm, where the, the material gets tucked in. So when we go back to Batman here, imagine that there's a finger underneath that shoulder, and it's basically casting these shapes here. I was, uh, you know they say that drawing, there's a subconscious part of drawing, and I believe that to be true. I mean, there's a part that we intend to draw, and then there's a part of us that uh, we might not necessarily know is in our, our, our minds as we're doing it. I, uh, I was on vacation this week with my family, and I walked, I was in this same pose with my daughter. <laughs> she was riding on top of me, and, uh, so I think maybe that kind of inspired this uh, shot. She's 22 years old though, so it was really weird. Um, it was actually the, the two and a half year old. So, yeah. so there, there's, there's Batman. Okay. That's the, the, the infinite kick, Batman. The uh, his, his symbol there goes. Oh, sorry. So the, there's the bicep there, and that's the shoulder under the, the, the shadow underneath the bicep. The forearm, he's got the, the glove here, so I can go black in there. Keep it really kind of big. Maybe the knee would, would show up here. This is going to be the shadow of the cape. Right? So it's, it's, it's deliberately kept kind of simple. better to suggest it than to actually draw it anyway. Okay. I don't I, I wouldn't suggest necessarily putting directly on your drawings. Unless you have a lot of white out. Um, this brush is not ideal. Usually you want to get something that uh, comes to a point. Okay. If, and you see it's kind of a, a dry, what we'll call a dry brush. It's, it's not completely loaded with ink. Well, not always, but um, when it's not, you can create some nice kind of uh, textures. So this has a very kind of sketch, uh, sketchy uh, kind of quality to it, which I enjoy doing. It's, uh, it's going to be a little rougher than what you'll see printed. That's why the comic books usually take so long when I pencil the work. Very meticulous, and I race, and I, clean, and I redraw things, and I'm really get it down to one specific line for everything I'm doing. And since, since these legs are underneath her, I can actually... 
just su suggest the structure I move. Okay. All right, so now I've got a, basically what I've called spotted the blacks, all the major shadows. And I can go in and, and clean this up to help create more of this kind of barrel shape on this, on this thing. I'm going to go in and do this. And again, it goes back to this cross hatching. I'm just really trying to create a gray variant, gradient. So like if you had a barrel, like a coffee can, and there's a light over here, this side's gonna be darker. So you do something like that. And to make it look more three-dimensional, you can cast that shadow like that. So this is just essentially a, a, a coffee can. And uh, basically creating a, a gradient across it. And I'm going to do it in a way that's very organic, meaning the lines aren't, they don't look like they're exactly the same next to each other. They're, they're just kind of free form. And that's because the material is wood. If it were metal, maybe I would make it more mechanical looking. The, the lines would be much more parallel and crisp. So now I'm just going back in and tightening up some of these lines. Fill in some of the blacks. Bless you. And so, um, again, you know, as I'm drawing these figures, um, the amount of time after the initial, uh, the initial structure drawing that you saw, and the refinements, and this really is the, the stuff that, you know, it's part of my style is the, the, the attention to detail or the, the little lines that you see um, like that. It just takes time, and so I can look at this and go like, it would take me another, you know, two hours to, to get it to a certain point that I would feel it was completely finished. And that's why the, the complex takes so long to draw, is that I can do a pretty quick gesture drawing and structure right away, but then it's going in and like doing these final touches and really just pulling it all together and making sure that all the shapes and the gradients and the lines are uh, as clean as they can be. As I, as I kind of tighten this up, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. It doesn't necessarily have to be about drawing per se, but or not. Can you have this one? Sure, if everyone else agrees to it. Uh, they t the pen uh, how tight are the pencils I give Scott? They tend to be very tight. Um, you know, I want them to be, a lot of times uh, they'll take books and uh, basically reproduce the pencils. Uh, and I remember the first time I saw reproduced pencils of John, John Byrne's work on uh, X-Men. I was just amazed at how tight they were. I really thought they'd be much looser. But he had everything there, and so I've always kind of wanted to emulate that level of, of, of tightness in the pencils and really give all the information there. And, and what Scott brings to the table is sometimes you'll see like two, a line and maybe a fainter line, and he really figures out what's the best line, what, what I meant with that line, or he'll uh, do some things with texture because there's certain things you can do with ink and a brush that you can't qu capture uh, using a pencil. So a lot of times I'll just draw rocks. Uh, if you have like a series of rocks like this, and I'll take the side of the pencil and uh, just kind of recon some shapes, right? These are the shadows, right? And so when you go in with ink, you can basically, there's a number of ways you can, you can trap the lines like this, right? Keep it really crisp like that, or you can, uh, you can do a dry brush up approach. where you use the actual hairs of the brush to create texture, right? So there's all these different ways you can interpret that, that little uh, bit of pencil that I put down. 
So that's the fun part for him as an anchor, I think, is to, to figure that stuff out. And it's not just rocks that have texture, but metal. Like you'll see a lot of times, you see a, you see a little figure. deck of the, uh, the Justice League satellite carrier or whatever it is. And uh, um, sometimes you do a shadow and you just basically do something like that. Sell it. It's just a, like a technique, but it's basically like a shiny surface will have ripples. It's basically reflections of light that might be across the ceiling. And so you can uh, just. Right? So it makes it look like it's like a shiny surface. Does that make sense? You see that? It helps if this pose actually matches the shadow, but uh, you get the idea. Anyway, so we'll go back to this character. I'm just going to fix up a couple things. Now I'm going to use white out to kind of clean, clean it up. This is what I would normally do with a um, eraser. Do I always start with what? White? The body. The body. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. I do. The torso and the pelvis, that's why I started with that. That's, that's the core of the figure. The limbs can kind of go everywhere and they're going to move in different positions, but the, uh, where the, the torso and the pelvis fall on top of one another really solidifies and gives uh, that character um, mass and, and weight, is what we call it. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's in all of them. So uh, you'll have the same torso and pelvis, but then um, you might widen it a little bit. So I kind of start with the basic torso and pelvis, and then I'll widen uh, elements based on the character for both male and female characters, based on their, their physique or build. Um, but you kind of start with this, the, the, the same central starting points. So you see I'm just drawing in some uh, of the, uh, the shadows there. This leg is too long, that foot, I guess. Do I usually draw all my shadows in? Oh, when I pencil? Yeah. If you, if you uh, look at some, like there's a Hush Unwrapped book, or I put up pencils online, uh, I, I fill it in. I think it looks nicer. I mean, you don't have to. You can just draw like a, an X. If you write an X in the shape, that means fill it in with black. Um, but a lot of times it's hard to tell if it's going to look right with the shadows where you put X's, and so I'll go ahead and put that in with uh, the side of the pencil. Yeah, I got a question. This is Rapidograph ink. It's, uh, it's uh, permanent ink, and I like it because it, it has a nozzle and you can pour it directly onto the drawing. Um, I tend to work on an angled table, and so if you have an ink bottle, like it's going to slide off the table, 
or spill out, or I'll knock it over. Um, this tends to be also very portable, um, and it has a real nice consistency and level uh, of, of opaqueness. Uh, once you get into inking, you'll find that um, all these different companies, uh, from Pelican Ink to uh, I, there's, there's many, but they all have a different quality to them, and uh, you just have to experiment with what you like. Some some are more viscous and, and harder to fill in large areas, and, but um, others are more liquid and, and very easy to fill in areas. But they tend not to be as opaque, and so they don't they don't give you the, the true blacks that you might necessarily want. This pen I'm using now is what? I'm not sure if I heard the question. Oh, I usually don't ink my own work. Scott uses a purple pen. Those are things like the old, during the Revolutionary War, they would have these uh, things with, yeah, little nibs like that. And it's basically a, a piece of metal. If you uh, zoom in here. And uh, basically the ink gets stuck in between these two little metal prongs and as you apply pressure, the prongs separate and uh, through the power of, uh, I think, water tension, <laughs> uh, the ink basically uh, stays connected to the metal prongs and you can draw like a thicker line. So you can, with one, one um, throw of the hand, you can draw a line that looks like like that, right? And so it's super nice when you're doing a lot of gradients because you could do this in three quick strokes as opposed to using a magic marker and having to do multiple strokes and also having it look kind of rough, right? But it's a lot easier to use a marker and so I eventually, I never did enough inking so I used to ink with a Procol but now I just use a marker. And this is a, it's a Micron Pigma marker and it basically um, it uh, it's permanent ink and uh, they you know they're sold at most art stores. So does anyone have any more paper? Any more backing boards? Okay. Alright so that was How do I balance the muscularity of Batman with... Yeah, I didn't... I, I couldn't... Oh yeah, uh, I don't know, I've, I've drawn some pretty... Um, uh, bulky Wonder Woman shots. <laughs> I think there's a shot of like Psylocke I did from like the 90s where she's in a swimsuit, she's got her arms up like this, and she, she's got huge guns, and I'm like, wow, oh, that didn't quite come out the way I wanted, but, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to put a little muscle, uh, a bit of muscle on like a character like Wonder Woman, I think it makes a lot of sense, and uh, you just gotta make sure not to make the necks look too buff, I think that's the secret, right? If, 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 you don't really, if the necks are looking a little too thick, I think that's where you start losing some of that femininity. But it's, it's actually interesting with Wonder Woman. You could actually ask, put a lot of mass on her and uh, kind of get away with it, and, and, and people don't necessarily see that you've actually given her a lot of body mass. So I'm do, so this is one, I'm just gonna do a couple quick headshots in the remaining amount of time, so we have more than one image. That went very uh, fast. I literally thought we had 30 minutes left and we have like five. Is there anything going on after this? Is there another panel? Sonny? Right, we can push that back a little bit, right? So, uh, hold on. I'm going to try to do a couple more. So, um, okay, very quickly, if you're drawing ahead, let's do Wonder Woman since we talked about it. Again, just make sure that, that the neck is not too, too thick. Here's the egg, here's the, uh, the neck, it's offset. This line, that's where the ear comes. Go from the ear to the eyes, down here to the nose, down here to the mouth. There you go. Star goes right here. 
Yes. How do we hire new writers? I would say that's a very tough thing to uh, do because it's a lot easier to show someone your art samples and they can take a quick look at it and they can tell literally from one page of that if you have the chops to get professional work. With writing, you kind of have to read the whole story, right? You have to read like 20 pages of script to see if, if the writer set up a story that basically had a um, a payoff, so it's a lot harder. I would actually suggest, suggest in this day and age, you don't need to have, you don't need to wait to hear from DC to be validated, or any company to be validated as a writer. You can find creators online, you can find uh, artists on deviantart.com, uh, and you can uh, start doing comic books on your own without a publisher and have them published online, uh, and, and really kind of, learn how to work with other people and learn how to collaborate and uh, if you do that enough you will find a following and if you have a following people will hire you because they want to sell comic books so that's what I would do um, I you know I broke in by basically doing a lot of sample pages and mailing them off to editors um, and I got very few responses but uh, and that was very tedious I mean it was like $90 uh, every time I would go to, this, to the Xerox store and make photocopies and I'd have to make a set for every editor from every company I knew of and I would mail them out and basically have to wait weeks to get a reply if I got a reply at all. Uh, now you can just email people. Um, so you have incredible ease of access, but the problem is everyone has that same ease of access. So in a way they're less likely to look at it. So. I wouldn't, wait, I wouldn't wait to hear back from the big companies. If you want to be a writer, start writing. And if you have good writing, people will want to work with you. And if people want to work with you, you'll produce great stuff. And you will eventually get hired or be given assignments of things that you want to do. Jim, right. I got a question. Sure. Um, when you're drawing, like, from your current drawing to now, as to what you've done in the past, do you ever go back and look and go, wow, my drawing has evolved, but like it's uh, like I, I, what was I thinking with that piece? Or, oh yeah, or, you know, <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, to, to now, you know, because your your pieces are always evolved, and they always keep getting better and better with each piece. So I mean, do, is it something that you methodically do? You know, just go back. And I, I don't look back on a lot of stuff. I actually look back on a lot of my work here at conventions when people bring it up to for me to sign. I don't have a lot of that stuff. Uh, available, and it's like you know, you, if you guys keep pictures of yourself from like the 90s or 80s, depending on how old you are, you look back on those and go like, oh, what was I thinking in terms of what I was wearing, or the, you know, that's very much what I kind of experience when I see the artwork from that era. Um, so, uh, it, and even things I thought I really did well or kind of nailed uh, poses, I look at it now and go like, oh boy, that that head looks really small. Or, you know, the cross-hatching is just way too over the top. So it, it's always, uh, you're always gonna have that kind of nostalgic look. If you look back on anything, any photo of yourself, you're just gonna go like this. You're gonna see like how your tastes have changed and how your aesthetic has changed because of that, so. Try and make uh, lemon with lemonades here. This brush is really uh, not helping me out, so I'm trying to kind of just draw the shadows in as opposed to... Um, I have the design of the costume, like the one that was part of the New 52 before they started production on Superman. I, I, I don't know if they were influenced by it. It's, um, I haven't asked uh, Zack Snyder that directly. Um, but I know that he was looking at a lot of the comic book work and he specifically called out the work I did. Um, although the work I did was on For Tomorrow and that didn't have the, the new costume. Uh, he is a fan of comic books, and I think he is inspired by the stuff that, that's produced in comics, so it wouldn't surprise me. But the, uh, 
That design predated the U52 by at least a year, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, even like the Flash TV show, I thought they were somewhat influenced by the U52 design a bit. Um, so, you know, I think they take from it what they, what they need. You know, whenever you're, you're going into a new medium, whether it's, uh, hello, whether you're going into uh, film or TV, uh, some things are, are, are going to look good on a complex page, but might not look good in real life. Oh, the phone, sorry, okay. Alright, thank <laughs> you. Right, no, it's okay. If it was someone older, I would have been like, okay, <laughs> security. <laughs> so. Maybe she just wanted to. A horsey ride or something. Um, anyway. Okay, so. You have a question? Can someone closer repeat that? Amplify? What made you get into comic book oh, drawing? What made me become a comic book artist? Yes. Um, you know what? I, I just really loved comic books from when I was just a little kid. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of, uh, if you were into fantasy or adventure or science fiction, there just wasn't, there wasn't Star Wars, there wasn't, all these cartoon shows, there was nothing, really. It was like uh, a lot of movies with giant insects, um, you know, Frankenstein, uh, that kind of stuff. And I just loved um, these incredible stories and in, in, the, in the world of comic books, you could do these amazing cosmic battles or characters that could fly and, you know, melt walls with their eyes and all these really cool things that you could not find on TV or film. And uh, so I just like that, and, I, and so when you have a lot of downtime and you're trying to create cool stories, the best way to do that was to sit, sit around and kind of draw them, and uh, so that's what I did. You know, I just drew a lot as a kid, and I really looked at comic books, I think the same way people today look at, um, you know, the big summer tentpole movies at, uh, for inspiration. You know, but literally, my friends and I would go to church, and then after you know service or whatever, we'd go to to, to one of the classrooms and just sit around and, and make up our own stories and write the roster of the X Men and the Avengers and who would fight who and how the fights would you know go and start drawing some of that stuff. And it was just uh, you know it, we didn't have video games to distract us, so that was what we did instead. How many hours a day do I dedicate to drawing? So this week I dedicate zero drawings to, to drawing, and uh, I'm, you're seeing the uh, the payoff of that the dedication. Um, it's a little bit of a struggle today, um, but normally, normally I, I will um, depends on the day. But as co-publisher, I'll go up to Burbank from San Diego. I wake up at five, 5 in the morning, I'm on the 6.45 train, I get in the office at 9.30, and I'm in the office from 9.30 to 4 o'clock, and that's just all business stuff. It's like uh, meetings about uh, marketing plans, um, you know, what storylines we're going to run, uh, what kind of paper, uh, who's going to publish our books, um, all that kind of stuff. And then I get home around 8 o'clock, and uh, have dinner with the family, and I'll just hang out for a while. And, Usually around 10, 30 or 11, I'll draw, and I'll draw until about three. <laughs> I'm sorry, right, so I'll draw until like three in the morning, you know? Um, so that's, so like five hours to, to eight hours a day, you know? The days I go up to Burbank, it makes it uh, a little bit harder. My influence as a kid uh, would be, all the real popular ones, I bought my comic books at like 7-Eleven, I didn't go to a comic book shop because I didn't know where one existed because there was no Google Maps at the time. Um, and uh, so, you know, like George Perez, Frank Miller, John Byrne, that kind of thing. My favorite character as a kid, I was a real, you know, I loved Superman and Batman when I was like eight or nine, but then when I 
became a teenager, I was just really into the, the X-Men and some of the Marvel stuff. Uh, so those were probably my favorite at the time. And so when I got into comics, I really wanted to work at Marvel and then work on the X-Men just because that was really kind of like my dream aspiration or whatever. Um, the favorites you draw, I would say, it really depends. You know, when you draw too much of one thing, it, it, it just gets very boring. But I would say that Batman is a lot of fun to draw. Um, but I like drawing Batman with a character like Nightwing or Robin next to him because it, what it basically does is uh, it gives you an incredible contrast. So you're not just drawing one type of note. You're not just drawing a, a, a dark, somber, hulking character all the time. You're drawing, uh, you're drawing like a, a dark character like Batman, then you get to draw this kind of lighthearted Robin character next to me. So that's kind of fun having that contrast. So you're not just exercising one muscle constantly. Uh, I, I, I draw mostly on paper, like what you're seeing now, obviously not with ink. Um, but I'll do like a lot of my color concept work will be done on the Cintiq. It's basically a computer screen that you can draw on top of. And uh, you know, what I like about it is you can add a color and then you can instantly undo it or you can undo 15 steps of, of color work that you've done. So it gives you a lot of uh, uh, freedom and, and options. So with this, I'm gonna, I know I've got this awful brush I can use, so I'm going to basically break, break out the, uh, the shapes, right? Can you see that? My opinion on light boxes? I use light boxes. Yeah, they're good for a couple things. If you want to draw a motorcycle, like Black Canary is riding on Alistar Batman or Robin, I went and bought an actual Harley model that I wanted, and I basically took photographs, and then imported them to Photoshop, and then I used the lens to kind of stretch them based on the perspective and the uh, angle I wanted. I print those out in high contrast, and then I would light box that on. But you can't light box and copy every little detail because then it looks like a light box drawing, so you have to almost kind of apply your own filter and simplify reality so that it matches the level of detail that you, you give to the rest of the world, you know, to your buildings and your cars. Uh, so it's useful in that respect. Um, but in terms of figure work, the stuff I do is so exaggerated, it doesn't really make sense to lightbox a figure. Uh, it's a lot easier. I like to look at reference and then extrapolate it into a style that works, but um, lightboxing figures, uh, you'll, you'll find that the heads are much larger and the bodies are a lot shorter than the way we draw them in comic books. What's your favorite character to draw? Will I do a podcast with David Cho? Yeah, eventually. You know, uh, David is a good friend of mine, uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's like always on the road, though. And uh, so we're gonna figure out a time to do that. What was it like working with Chris Claremont back in the day? Um, it was nerve wracking, I'll tell you. I remember, I wish they had texting back then because that's the only way I would have communicated with Chris Claremont because, you know, imagine you're a fan of a book and you get hired to draw that book and now you're gonna call up the creator and talk to him on the phone and uh, that's what I was doing. I remember, you know, like literally rehearsing in my head what I was going to say to Chris. Like, I didn't want to be too much of a fanboy and go like, oh, you remember this scene? I love that, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to find out like, what was Wolverine's real origin and all this kind of <laughs> fanboy kind of stuff. And I just remember calling him up and trying to be like all nonchalant, like, oh, hey, like I, I call up, you know, combo creators all the time. And it's just really an awkward, nerve wracking experience. But he was very. Uh, kind and, and uh, uh, he loves to uh, talk about the characters and so you know he basically said look um, tell me what you want what, what you like what do you like drawing and like what characters do you like I like Captain America I like Black Widow I like World War II he said great we'll do a story about Captain America Wolverine Black Widow said World War II and he came up with the the Magic Force storyline which was like 268. And so um, it was really cool, but again, I didn't want to co constantly call him because, like, literally, it would be like, how many days have passed since I called Chris? Okay, it's too soon. <laughs> he'll, think, he'll think I'm stalking him or I love him. I'll wait 
two more days and call nonchalantly an hour. He might be eating lunch, and that way, I'll send a message like, I'm not too desperate, maybe he'll call me back, right? And so, it's a lot of that going on. But today, the bees could have just text him and be like, no, no pressure, whatever. He'd be like super chill and cool about it. Uh, anyway. You do have another pen. Okay, so I'm lighting you. All right, I'm very, uh, I'm just gonna fill out this, this uh, thing here and show one last little technique. Did they give out tickets? Do you guys have anything that has numbers or anything like that? No. Driver's license, okay, here's what we're gonna do. If someone has a birthday today, they can prove it by showing driver's license. Bachelor party. Bachelor party. Bachelor party? Yeah! What are you doing here? <laughs> You know this is Vegas, Las Vegas. I do understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You guys made the wrong turn. No one's birthday is today. Uh, there? We have two people. One person. This is how you do very quick rain and storm clouds. I'm almost done, Johnny. Do you like, uh... Almost done. So then if someone has a, uh... Gosh. So we have one, we have two. How many do we have? Yeah. Anyway, so that's it. I'm sorry uh, it took so long, guys, but uh, thank you for... Uh...